Please welcome ConnectY CEO, Arnie Bellini. All right, good morning. I see we've had the normal House of Blues fallout. Now, I talked to you about reinvention yesterday, and let me tell you, you guys took it seriously, because a lot of you came up to me at the House of Blues and go, dude, I have reinvented myself. I am now a party animal. <laughs> was not what I had in mind, okay? But I'm really glad that you guys had such an awesome time last night. Uh, you know, some partners came up to me and they said, hey, look, man, you said it's about uh, getting educated and partying, so you're going to stay up with us. And so I got to bed at 3 o'clock last night. I'm really excited today. We started the concept of reinvention, talked a lot about reinvention yesterday. And, you know, I shared with you that this book, page 213, was the initial reinvention uh, for me in my career. But let me tell you something. This book here, The Road to Reinvention by Josh Lenkner, all of you have this book. This is the book that really turbocharged me in 2014 to reinvent ConnectWise and to really get on this whole concept of the world is being reinvented right in front of our very eyes. So we, the technologists of the world, are the ones that should lead that change. So we brought Josh Lincoln here to talk to you today. And this guy is a story of reinvention. He started his career as a jazz musician. Then he decided he was going to start selling hardware in about 1990. And he became a value-added reseller. Sold that business. Uh, for about, you know, a million dollars. Started a web development company. Sold that business for $40 million. Then he started a little company called ePrize, which he wouldn't give him the exact figures. Uh, but he sold that for a bunch of money, another technology company. And he's into a brand new thing now where he's a venture capitalist for technology companies. And so he is one of us. He is from our space. And he has a lot of knowledge about what we do, and he's reinvented himself about four times. And I got to tell you, if you have not read the book yet, please, please read this book within the next week. It's a very easy read. You'll get a lot out of it. I'd like to welcome to stage Mr. Josh Linkner. Anybody who has swam the English Channel is just a rock star in my book. I, did you know that Arnie swam the English Channel? Seriously, that's ridiculous. Wow, talk about reinventing. Uh, I am so amped up to be here today, and I don't say that in some, oh, it's nice to be here kind of way. I really mean it, because I feel like the folks in this audience are family. I've been a tech entrepreneur my whole career. I've been involved in the launch, startup, or funding of about 100 tech startups. And uh, my first business, as, as Arnie just mentioned, was a, a reseller. For those to date myself a little, I used to build 286s. I would mail order the motherboard. We'd put like four megs of RAM in this thing, a 10 meg hard drive with an amber screen, and sell it for like five grand. <laughs> so I really feel connected uh, to, to the folks here today. I'm so excited to be here talking about the exact topic that's on everyone's mind is how do we take the momentum that we have in our industry from here and take it to the next level? It's funny, I was building one of my companies, and I just received a $3 million commitment, a verbal commitment from my investor. So based on that verbal commitment, hired new people, took it, new office space, placed expensive ads. I was all in. Then I got this call. Hey, Josh, you know that $3 million we talked about? Listen, we've decided to get out of the venture capital business altogether. Turns out that the internet stocks are in the tank. We, we are going to just exit peacefully. Uh, even though you have no money on your balance sheet and you're underwater, just, we're pulling out. But hey, don't, don't take it personally. <laughs> don't take it personally. I could feel my stomach in a knot, sweating. All the color rushed out of my face. I didn't know if I was going to puke or faint or both. Because I realized that all the work that my colleagues and I had done up until that point was about to fall into the abyss. Figured what would happen next likely would shape the rest of my career. 
What happened next was basically three months of hell, clawing and scratching for survival, trying to dislodge my previous investor and find some new ones in 2000, trying to invest in a company that started with the letter E. Anyway, it all came down to one moment. I'm sure many of us have had a similar moment in our careers, but it was a Friday afternoon. We were having our regularly scheduled team meeting. It was an all-company meeting, maybe 40 people at the time. The problem was that that was the same day payroll was due, and I woke up that morning with zero dollars in the bank, zero. We stretched vendors, payables, went as far as we could go, finally hit the wall. I had no idea what was going to happen that day. Not exaggerating, 15 minutes before our entire company was gone, they padlocked the doors and carried us out. Received a wire transfer from new investors. So I walked into this meeting, exhausted, sweating, and said, folks, we saved this company. That was such a pivotal moment, and we went on to grow and grow, and ultimately, that company grew to about 500 people. Oops, looks like we're a little bit out of order here. That, that company grew to about 500 people. Sorry about that. I got a picture of it for you right here. There we go. Grew about 500 people, and uh, ended up selling in 2012. So this sounds like a heroic story, but really it was a failure story on my behalf. It was bad leadership. Because yeah, I was able to win that fight largely by luck, a little bit of hard work, but it was a fight that I should have never had to deal with at all. Because my job as a leader would have been to reinvent six months earlier when things were going great. And when the market started to change, when the NASDAQ went from 5,000 down to 1,000, that's when I needed to be changing. When my dot-com customers were all evaporating and going away, that's when I needed to be reinventing. But like so many of us, I became all caught up in the hype. We were successful, we were this internet company, we were gonna take over the world. And that has been the downfall of so many companies. So on that note, I want you to just take a quick look at these logos on the screen. Just think to yourself, what do you think that they have in common? Dead, gone, out of business? So all those are true. I mean, obviously these companies suffered greatly. And, and I gotta tell you, it really bothers me because behind each logo were real families and real communities that were devastated because leaders failed to reinvent. And that's exactly what happened. They, they didn't adapt, they didn't evolve, they didn't innovate. The other thing that really strikes me is that each of these companies were once the dominant player in their field. They were the rock stars in their industry. So the lesson to me, it's so specific and powerful. It's that no matter how great our last quarter was or our last year's results, we can't become intoxicated by our own success. In fact, success is a temporary condition, not a permanent state that happens in the context of many external factors that today are changing at a rate like none other in history. So it's our job as IT leaders, as entrepreneurs, as managed service providers, to make sure that we are on the forefront of reinvention rather than having to fight back from adversity. Turnarounds are for people that weren't proactive. By the way, once a company that was previously a leader has to embark on a turnaround effort, they only regain their leadership position about 10% of the time. Certainly not odds that any of us can embrace. So I want to show you an example of how fast this stuff is happening today and how the world is moving so dramatically and also how none of us, no matter how successful, are immune. Gillette, you probably know, the dominant player in razor blades. They have a 70% market share, billions of dollars of advertising. So you might say, how could somebody possibly compete with Gillette? I want to show you how one entrepreneur is taking them head on, not through more money or resources, but through more creativity. Check it out. Lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you.
We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandra, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. So it was great, right? So this guy, his name is Mike, he starts a business. By the way, this is not a Saturday Night Live skit. Real guy, real company. And he says, all right, I'm gonna take Gillette head on. So he launches this company, he spent only $4,000 to produce the video, more than half of which went to rent a warehouse that you saw wasn't even his. <laughs> so, so he launches this video, spends zero dollars in paid advertising. But because the message was so powerful, the world took notice. By the end of the first week that this video launched, it had been seen by three million people around the world. By the end of that same week, Mike had 17,000 paying customers in a mature industry with a dominant market leader in a commodity field at a teeny little price point. If that type of disruption can happen to Gillette, to us that represents our biggest opportunity and our biggest threat all in one. So I wanna challenge you for a minute today. No matter what your business card says, CEO of managed services company or IT provider or software engineer, I think we need to add an implicit unwritten title, that of disruptor or innovator or business artist or entrepreneur. Because what's happened is that creativity, innovation, these have become the currency of success. We know that in these challenging times, there's no way we can keep doing things the old way and expect to win. Today, an entirely new set of skills are needed in order to meet the challenges of the day. And think about the world that we live in, the world you live in. Today we live in a world of dizzying speed, exponential complexity, and ruthless competition. So again, how do we fight back? How do we make sure that we're not only successful today, but for years and years to come? So what happens is that sustainable success goes to those that are willing to disrupt before they become disrupted. They're willing to, from a position of strength, from a position of success, challenge conventional wisdom, shatter the status quo, and ultimately move forward with something bold and new and original. So as Arnie mentioned earlier, I had the privilege of writing this book and, and one other. I'm an entrepreneur by trade and now a venture investor. But I became obsessed with the topic of innovation and creativity. Because ultimately, that's what drives progress, whether it's in business or in our communities. So I thought I'd share some big ideas with you this morning from the research of the book and also from my own career. And I hope that you can take a look at it with really two lenses. Certainly with the lens as a business leader, as a tech business leader. But also take a look at it through the lens as a person in your community, a father or mother, sister, brother. Because these are the exact same attributes that drive momentum in our families and of course in our communities. So, we're gonna dive into five specific ideas. What I found in talking to innovators, and by the way, research on the book, I talked to about 200 thought leaders. Billionaires, CEOs, nonprofit leaders, military leaders, artists, musicians, you name it. I found this amazing common threads. Even though they're in different fields and different geographies, there were these commonalities, which is what I wanted to share with you today. The five obsessions of innovators. The first thing that innovators are obsessed with is that they encourage courage. They encourage courage. It turns out that fear is the single biggest blocker of creativity. It's that poisonous force that robs you of your best thinking. We've all done it. You're in a meeting, you have a great idea, but instead of sharing it, you hold it back. You might talk yourself out of it. Well, gee, what would my boss say? Who's gonna fund my idea? If it goes forward and it doesn't work out, what does that mean to my career? Better keep my mouth shut. The problem is, if you're breeding that type of fear in your company or in yourself, you are missing the most powerful natural resource at your disposal, 
which is the incredible creative brain power of your team. So you fight back by creating a culture that celebrates new ideas and simply strips out judgment altogether. So the next time someone comes to you with a bad idea, it happens, and your instinct as a busy leader might be to say, eh, terrible idea, go back to your cube. The problem is, if you do that, you just train the person to never share another idea again. A much more productive response might be to say something like, tell me more about this idea. What was the thinking that led you to this conclusion? Where do you see it headed in the future? So now the person goes back to their desk feeling heard and validated and understood. They may come back with three or four bad ideas in a row, but so what? Because they may show up one day with that game-changing killer idea, the idea that drives revenue 30% next year, the idea that would have never come to the surface in most companies that are so busy penalizing fresh thinking. I don't know if you noticed this, but if you have five people in a room, one person has an idea, the other four become the instantly self-appointed idea police. And they're so quick to tell you all the reasons it's not gonna work out and it won't fit in the PowerPoint and, who's, and all the bad stuff. Let's get rid of that and start really celebrating the, the driver of progress, which is brand new creative ideas. You know, we also have a myth that ideas have to come out perfectly hatched. Totally false. In fact, most breakthroughs come out as something that is not fully defensible. But then over time, through some experiments and setbacks and even failures, it leads to something great. One of my favorite examples of that is WD-40. You know, the cure for all things squeaky? The name, I don't know if you know this, the name stands for Water Displacement 40th Experiment. Could have easily been WD-31. What the makers of WD-40 know and what we all need to embrace is that mistakes are not fatal. Mistakes are simply the portals of discovery. That's how we learn, that's how we grow, that's how we drive progress. A Couple other quick fun examples. One company that I interviewed issues every year a failure of the year award. Here's what they say, they have this big banquet and, and they celebrate you know, other stuff, the team member of the year and the project of the year, but also the failure of the year. So what happens is they announce this for the person or team that had a good idea. The numbers made sense, they went for it, didn't work out at all. But instead of firing the person, they give them a standing ovation. Pat them on the back, slap and high five, way to fail! <laughs> I'm certainly not suggesting that our goal is to build companies that fail. But I am suggesting that if we can understand the importance of creativity, the importance of free thinking, that will in turn drive progress. Because the companies that win the most also fail the most in little ways. Another fun example of that, another company that I interviewed issues every team member two corporate get out of jail free cards every year. Here's what they say, go out on a limb, be creative, take responsible risks. And if you really screw something up, hand us a card and you're off the hook, no questions asked. At the annual reviews, a team leader will actually be disappointed with a team member if they haven't used both of them. So I know what you're thinking. Oh, it feels so risky. Perhaps. But let me challenge you this morning. What's the risk of not doing something like this? Irrelevance? Mediocrity? Getting passed by? So many people, so many organizations live their lives trying to play it safe, only to discover that today playing it safe has become one of the riskiest moves of all. So I want to encourage you to get curious. Curiosity is very much the building block of creativity, the building block of innovation, which in turn drives reinvention. How do you do this, practically speaking? Like what's a tool and technique to do it? Essentially, you want to ask a lot more questions. We're very easy to leap to conclusions. But I want you to consider pausing for a minute and saying why, what if, or why not? Because when you ask these questions, it forces you to challenge conventional wisdom. It forces you to imagine what can be instead of just what is. Our friend Mike did that. What if I sold razors online? They're never sold on a subscription basis. Well, why not? So that same curiosity led to Mike's breakthrough. The same curiosity can lead to all of ours. Okay, so we're gonna continue on here in our journey. And our second big idea, the second obsession of innovators is that they are obsessed with shedding the past. 
So I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I don't, do we have any Detroiters in the audience? All right. Yes. So I'm a die-hard, like hardcore Detroiter, born in the city. My grandparents were born in the city. I'm very passionate about my hometown. But look what happens. It's such an interesting story about what happens when you shed or don't shed the past. Several hundred years ago, we were a fur trading company, then a, 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 a town, then a lumber town. When we shed the past and became an automotive town, our city prospered. Came up with new ideas. A hundred years ago, that was the Silicon Valley of our country. Then what happened? We stopped reinventing. We stopped shedding the past. In fact, we clung to the past. We thought we were untouchable. We refused to respond to foreign threats. You name a problem, we had it. Racial divisiveness, corruption, tax, uh, dwindling tax base, all, all the problems you can imagine. And when we stopped shedding the past, our city crumbled. We were a national punchline. Today, though, you may have heard in the media that Detroit's on the comeback. There's this incredible revitalization that's happening. And the only reason we're able to reinvent is because we're letting go of what Detroit was in favor of what Detroit can be. One fun example of that, my partners and I launched a venture capital fund in downtown Detroit called Detroit Venture Partners. Crazy idea. We're going to fund tech companies, not in Silicon Valley or New York or Boston, but in downtown Detroit. And the thinking is that using tech entrepreneurship as a vehicle for social change to not only make money, but more importantly, to make a difference to diversify our economy, to keep our young kids in the state, to build a vibrant urban core. So what's happened is amazing. A couple years back, there were no tech companies anywhere to be found. This is our building in downtown Detroit. And today, there are 70 tech companies within one square block of this building. The only reason I bring it up is that here's a, a, an organization, in this case, the city of Detroit, that plummeted so far and had such hugely complex issues Yet finally, by shedding the past, we were able to regain our momentum. Today, we're rising from the ashes. And I truly believe our best days are yet to come. So other example of shedding the past, because it's such an important thing to let go. And it's not easy in the tech world, because a solution that worked last month or last week that you feel really connected for your customer, that may have been really relevant at the time. But today, there's a new way, a better way. And it's very difficult to let go, especially when we were successful. One fun example, this is the ubiquitous pill bottle that we all know and hate. It's been the same for decades. And from an industrial design standpoint, it's just awful. Think about it. It's tilted sideways, so you can't read it. The biggest symbols are the medical symbol and the QR code, not so helpful. The biggest print is your name. I think you probably already know that. So it's a terrible design. And not only that, there's a real issue in our country where people take the wrong medication in the same household. It's a big problem, big health issue. So what has the pharmaceutical industry done about this? Nothing. Same dumb pill bottle. It took a graduate student working on her uh, graduate thesis in industrial design to both literally and figuratively flip the model upside down. This is her design. Now think about how much better it is. It sits on this big cap so you can read the print on the, on the label. It tells you in clear letters what the actual medicine is. There's a patient info pullout card, so you can get more information if you need it. My favorite are these colorful bands. The bands represent a person in your household. So I could be green, my wife could be yellow. That way no one takes the wrong medication. The design was so much better, so breakthrough, that once she got a patent on it, Target has now licensed this design, and it's installed in every pharmacy of theirs system-wide. The progress didn't come by clinging to the past. The progress came by shedding it. All right, so our, our third idea, our third obsession of innovators is that innovators are obsessed with defying tradition. They hate saluting the flag of tradition. They want to defy it. One of my favorite examples of this is this guy. Uh, this guy's named Masood Hassani. Masood grew up just outside Kabul, Afghanistan. And as a kid, he saw some just horrible tragedies, largely due to landmines. In the desert region by his home, this was a real problem. In fact, it's a real problem in our whole world. Turns out there's 110 million of these killing machines on our planet. They kill 20,000 people a year, injure many times more. So as a boy, he said, I got to do something about this. This is ridiculous. I'm going to commit my life to making a change. The thing is, he could have followed a traditional path. 
The traditional way to clear landmines has been done about the same since the 1960s. It's expensive, it's dangerous, it's not all that effective. So here's what he did. He said, I'm going to defy tradition. And he came up with his own invention. He calls it the mine kafon. In his native language, that means mine exploder. And what this thing is, it's about six feet tall. And there are light bamboo rods that come from the core. And at the end of each bamboo rod is a clay disc. So these things end up being light enough to be wind propelled. So they blow across the desert floor, kind of like how tumbleweed would blow across the desert floor. So they're light enough to be driven by wind, but the clay disks are heavy enough to detonate the landmines beneath the surface. The result, profound. Not dangerous at all, far more effective, and over 100 times less expensive per landmine cleared than traditional means. The design made such an impact that it's now on permanent display at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. He did accomplish this by following the traditional route and making some incremental change. He accomplished this by completely defying tradition. A couple other fun examples because innovation, reinvention, creativity, it doesn't only apply to our product or service. It can apply to other aspects of our business. How do we conduct our Monday morning meeting? How do we create an experience that resonates with our customers and separates us from the competitive set? Here's a fun example. I know all of us are on airplanes all the time. And airplanes are almost indistinguishable. You hardly remember which airline you're on half the time. Unless you're in South Africa, flying Kalula Airlines, you might notice a slight difference. So Kalula doesn't take themselves so darn seriously. And in this case, they didn't reinvent their product, which is flying people around in airplanes. They reinvented the customer experience. They wanted to have a personality. And there's just no way you could confuse a Delta flight with a Kalula flight. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> so this type of creativity, this type of experiential uh, advantage goes way beyond the paint room. Here are some actual phrases that have been overheard on Kalula flights. We're pleased to announce that we have some of the best flight attendants in the industry. Unfortunately, none of them are on this flight. <laughs> Please be aware, our toilets are fitted with smoke detectors as well as video cameras for the captain's in-flight entertainment. <laughs> so in an era, in an industry that has been plagued with bankruptcy, Kalula not only gets a chuckle, but they outperform. This airline has enjoyed double and triple digit growth every year for a decade straight. It's not because they conform to tradition, it's because they defy it. Speaking of experiences, this is the Children's Hospital at the University of Pittsburgh. Now their customers are sick kids and their families. The folks that run this hospital, the leadership team, wanted to create a better experience. They wanted to better serve their community. And this, these weren't the docs, these were the leaders of the hospital. So they couldn't mess with the medical care, i.e. their product. So they said, how can we reinvent? How can we innovate and do a better job for our customers? How did they do it? These are the window washers. Here's a quick video that explains the thinking and ultimately the impact that this creative leap drove. Check it out. Children's Hospital has a patient and family centered care initiative. We look at various ways we can make the experience at Children's Hospital better for the families. The window washing event in Superheroes fits well into the patient and family centered care model. And we collaborated and had this, come, this project come together. We have four window cleaners dressed up as superheroes and they'll be repelling from the roof, doing window cleaning, and entertaining the children. Hey, my name is Mark Rico. I'll be Captain Man. I'm Jim Zaremba. I'll be Batman. My name is Edward Hedrick. Today I'm going to be Superman. I'm Rick Bollinger. I'll be Spider-Man. As a father of three, you know, to, to see a kid happy, especially uh, ill or hurt, you know, it really, it, it makes you feel good doing it. Anything we can do to bring a smile to their face, make their day go a little better, I like, I like Spider-Man. Like, no, like, no. 
superheroes take the attention away from the medical care and make it an exciting event as if they went someplace to do something fun. They enjoy it, they get very excited about it and talk about it for days and they forget why they were actually here. powerful stuff. The interesting thing is, the cost of the hospital system, zero. They came up with the idea, the window cleaning company happily bought the uniforms, and it worked for everybody. No productivity drop. Better for the kids, obviously. Better for the leaders, because now they're able to serve their community in, in a more a compelling way. It's even better for the window washers, who are previously doing a fairly mundane task, and now have meaning and purpose to their work. For you, the next time you're faced with a challenge, and we're faced with challenges all the time, big and small, I want you to consider this. Our instinct may be to throw money or people or resources or bandwidth at the problem. Try throwing your imagination at it. You may end up with a far better result. So in terms of a tool and technique that I want you to think about, basically what we're talking about is a judo flip. We're taking a problem and flipping it upside down. In other words, we're approaching the problem from a different angle, a creative, reinventive angle, and ending up with a far better solution. Staying in the medical tech world for a second, uh, this guy's name is uh, uh, Doug Dietz. So Doug is the head of the MRI division for General Electric. Great career, saved thousands of lives. But the problem he was stuck on was that kids hated these machines. Turns out 70% of small children needed to be sedated before going into these life-saving tests. So knowing that he couldn't change the machine, he decided to change the experience. So he launched something called Pirate Island. And besides redecorating, they actually had a whole video series and manuals that trained the hospital workers to tell the story differently. So it was no longer, hey kid, you're going to that big scary machine, stand still or else. It was you're going on an adventure. And as you're sailing on the seven seas, stand real still so those pirates don't come and tickle you. What happened? Crying and screaming ended, sedation stopped, and Doug absolutely reached his goal. But it gets better. He did it for the right reasons, to help sick kids. But then it became a new product line for General Electric. It's called the Adventure Series. And they make these things in any size, shape, color, layout. They work with the local community and make sure that it's something that's really compelling and feels safe for kids it became a significantly differentiated and profitable business unit for GE. Doug got a promotion, everybody wins. He won by defying tradition instead of saluting it. Okay, our next obsession of innovators here is that innovators are obsessed with getting scrappy. There's no way that Arnie and his brother built this incredible company at ConnectWise without getting scrappy. And very much, when I think about entrepreneurs, and I've been one and I've worked with entrepreneurs my whole career, I think the best way to describe it, and I know you experience the same thing, your journey is kind of like being MacGyver. So you remember the show from the late 80s, right? So this guy would find himself in some impossible situation. He's in the basement, he's tied to a chair, the building's about to explode, he's locked down, but somehow he figured it out. So instead of crying and whining about all the resources he did not have, he made do with what, his, what, was, what was at his disposal, which in his case was usually some duct tape and a paper clip. So sometimes, as entrepreneurs, we don't have tremendous amounts of resources, so we have to get scrappy. What I want you to do, essentially, is think small. Think like, even if you have a bigger organization, I know some of you do, think like a raw, brand new startup. How would someone with a fresh piece of paper approach the work? Here's a really fun example of how a bigger company is thinking small. DHL, not a small company, was trying to compete to get their message heard in the context of all these much bigger competitors that have way more money. Here's how DHL thought small, got scrappy, and is winning in a big way. Check it out. In many countries, DHL has more locations, more vehicles, and more employees. That's why DHL is faster. However, to communicate this with a classic advertising campaign is expensive. So why couldn't the competitors advertise for DHL?
For that purpose, giant packages were taped all over with thermoactive foil and cooled down below the freezing point. In this way, the competitors picked up a black package that transformed back at temperatures above freezing and delivered the message in the most beautiful colors to addresses in the city that were not that easy to find. After all, they were paid reasonably. The result, an innovative way to communicate. And everyone played along. Well, almost everyone. Thank you very much. Got scrappy and it worked. By the way, the cost was negligible. Bought a couple packages, hired a film crew, and not only did the people in that city get a kick out of it, the real magic was the YouTube video that went afterward that's now been seen by 20 million people around the world. And now I'm not the only one that every time I see a DHL logo, I chuckle. And think about the cost to message delivered ratio of that versus a traditional ad campaign. Wow. A couple just personal examples. As mentioned, I started my career as a jazz musician. And when I was studying music, I had a teacher that would force me to remove strings from my guitar. Sometimes I'd have to remove three, which is half of the strings from the instrument. So you would think with less resources, you'd probably be less creative. Totally the opposite happened. When I had fewer strings on the guitar, I was actually able to break free from traditional patterns. It forced me to look at the work in a different way. And I was able to solve musical problems in a completely fresh uh, approach. So again, getting scrappy, having fewer resources, sometimes can be a real driver of progress. As I was building my company, I got to a point, and I wanted to share the wealth with our team. We had a great quarter. The problem is I added up the numbers, and all I could afford to give was about 200 bucks a person. Not a very exciting bonus. So I had to get scrappy. I had fewer resources. I had to get scrappy. Here's what I did. It was a Thursday, I unplugged the servers, turned off the phone system, and said, guys, I'm kidnapping the company. I took everybody to the closest Best Buy, gave each person a $200 gift card, and said, you have to spend this right now. So pandemonium erupts. People are racing up and down the aisles. Oh, did you get the camera? Did you get the Xbox? <laughs> Those poor cashiers at Best Buy, <laughs> we had like 300 people just attacking them. But the point is this. If I gave everyone that bonus, it would have been forgotten 10 minutes later. But 18 months later, people were still talking about the day that we kidnapped the company. We got scrappy. Another fun example of this. <laughs> I was thinking one day about how often greatness is achieved in the face of adversity. You know, what would Austin Powers be without Dr. Evil? Or you have great sports rivalries or political rivalries. In our company, by 2004, five years in, we were the dominant player in our field. We were crushing our competitors. And we really didn't have some evil arch enemy to gun against, to, to push us, to fight the hard fight. So since we didn't have a giant competitor, I made one up. I want to introduce you to our fake, fictitious, made-up nemesis, the Slither Corporation. So I had this big company meeting, and I said to everyone, listen, there's a competitor out there. They're bigger than us. They're faster than us. They're more technically savvy. They're better financed. And everyone's jaws dropped. They thought we were the big guys in town. So this made-up competitor became part of our culture. It wasn't done to make us feel good. It was done to drive urgency, to get away from complacency. Here's what we did. We really had fun with it. Our spies would intercept memos from the Slither Corporation. We'd get Wall Street Journal clippings of their earnings report to, to drive us on. Uh, we sometimes dressed up in costumes that were the antithesis of our culture. Uh, anyway, what happened, though, is it also drove creativity and free thinking. So for example, before Slither, I would ask a question like, hey, how can we shorten our production time? People would clam up. They don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't want to piss somebody off. But so then we changed the question. We said, our spies at Slither just got a report. Slither just shaved two days out of their cycle time. How do you think they did it? Now, the whiteboards were filled with ideas because no one had any fear. No one was afraid what they were going to say. And so it really drove not only urgency, but it drove our creative thinking. I know each of us have our own real competitors, but I would like to challenge you. 
Think about what would the ideal competitor be if they were gunning right after you? If Mark Zuckerberg, Warren Buffett, and Bill Gates put a billion dollars together, opened up shop just down the street, and had your picture on their target, what would they do differently? How would they approach the work? They're never gonna have a down quarter. It's a really fun exercise to create your ideal competitor and then benchmark yourself against that rather than the actual folks in the real world. All right, so we're gonna zero in on our last big idea and then of course I'm excited to have some discussion time with, with Arnie. But the fifth obsession of innovators is that they are obsessed with pushing the boundaries. Fun example, clothing store. Well, clothing stores are really inefficient to run because the people are always having to fold the merchandise, get it back out there. Are there enough sizes on the, on the floor? Do the displays hold enough variations? There's all kinds of logistical problems. So how could someone push the boundaries in this environment? What about if they did this? They hung each pair of pants, in this case, singly, had a QR code. Someone can then just QR code in which jeans they want, which size they want, and then a clerk brings them to you back in the dressing room. Brilliant. It's a new company that I just discovered last week, but they are pushing the boundaries. In other words, they're reinventing, reimagining, in this case, what a retail showroom can be, not by adding a little twist to their normal display, but by completely blowing it up. We've often been told, hey, don't reinvent the wheel. You've been probably told that since you were a kid. Forget that. Our job is absolutely to reinvent the wheel, because if we don't, some competitor is going to come and throw it on top of us. Here's a fun example of how someone is both literally and figuratively reinventing the wheel. My tech friends in the room will dig this. Check it out. This is the Copenhagen wheel. It turns your ordinary bicycle into a smart electric hybrid by simply replacing your back wheel. Connect it to your smartphone, download the app, and you're ready to go. Bicycles are a great way to move around, yet sometimes distances are too long hills can get in the way, and hard journeys to work may leave you covered in sweat. The Copenhagen Wheel is here to change all of that. The technology was developed over several years at MIT together with the city of Copenhagen, one of the world's most innovative places for cycling. Its original inventors licensed the technology and founded Super Pedestrian, the startup where we are now working around the clock to bring the wheel to you. Like the best riding companion, the Copenhagen Wheel learns how you pedal and integrates seamlessly with your motion. It captures your energy when you brake or go downhill and gives you a push when you need it with three to 10 times your regular foot power. It's easy, ride it just like a normal bike. As you pedal, the motor automatically kicks in with no additional throttles or buttons. All technology for the Copenhagen Wheel is contained within the red casing, including motor, removable batteries, wireless connectivity, smart locking, multiple sensors, and an embedded control system. Use your smartphone to customize your ride, monitor your physical activity, gather information from your environment to share with your friends and fellow cyclists. And if you're a software developer, you can even create your own biking apps. So whether you carry yourself, your kids, or your gear, hills seem flat, distances shrink, and you can cycle just about anywhere. So transform your bike and transform the city. The Copenhagen Wheel. It's pretty cool, right? So the next time someone says to you, oh, don't reinvent the wheel, say, damn it, I am going to reinvent the wheel. Because that's the opportunity for progress. Go read about your most favorite heroes, your business heroes. Richard Branson, did he reinvent the wheel? Of course he did. Steve Jobs, these are people that took it upon themselves to push the boundaries. They were all about reinventing the wheel. So one thing I want you to think about from a tool standpoint is looking for that type of breakaway advantage, a 10x advantage. As a venture investor, and I've seen about 3,000 entrepreneurial pitches, it's almost like get to live Shark Tank. But anyway, we often ask ourselves, is there a 10x advantage? In other words, if you're going to launch a PayPal alternative that's only 2% better, forget it. PayPal will win. For us to fund a company, we have to look at ourselves and say, all right, do they have something that's got a 10x advantage? Could be a product advantage, could be a tech advantage, could be a customer service advantage. But there's got to be a real breakaway advantage to crack through the difficult gravity that can hold us back. Cirque du Soleil, 10x advantage. They didn't take on Barnum & Bailey Circus with one extra elephant. 
They completely blew up the model, adding theater, production, sound quality, and today they're a multi-billion dollar company. Barnes and ba Barnum and Bailey had to file bankruptcy a few years back. Pixar, 10x advantage, completely reimagined what animation could be, and now, of course, the Jobs estate is the largest single shareholder of the Disney company. So one last example, as we kind of wrap things down here, uh, of one of my favorite entrepreneurs. <laughs> this guy's named Tom Licks, L-I-X. So Tom's had a bit of a checkered past. He's had more failures than, than successes. So anyway, he raises some money, starts a company, goes for it, and it totally craters. This guy blows it. He loses everything. All his investors lost every penny. Tom is broke. He's about to lose his house. What would most people do in this scenario? Run for the hills of safety. Go take some soulless desk job for the rest of their lives. Not Tom. Tom thinks at this moment, at his lowest point, he says, I'm going to start a whiskey company. Apparently, he loves whiskey. Who doesn't, I guess, but Tom really loves whiskey. Actually, he was trained in the military. He was in the military at a young age. An officer showed him how to make hooch. So now he likes to say he's government trained in the field. <laughs> So here's what Tom does. He gets into the research and realizes that to make a good whiskey takes a decade or more. Tom didn't have a decade. Tom is about to lose his house. So he goes for this 10x push the boundaries approach. He said, wait a minute. Instead of putting the whiskey in the barrels to age, what if I put the barrels in the whiskey? So here's what he does. He takes these giant stainless steel tanks, and then he chops up uniform pieces of charred oak wood barrel, puts them in the tank with the liquid, and then he applies pressure. Turns out that this wood is very porous, like a sponge. So when you apply pressure, it soaks up the liquid. And when you release the pressure, the liquid flows back out, and it picks up the flavor profile of the wood. So what he does is he applies pressure, releases it. Applies it, releases it. So instead of making a good whiskey in a decade or more, Tom is making whiskey in a week. So you might say, all right, he's making it in a week. He's probably going to hide that fact. He's going to call it like Kentucky bourbon and blend in on the shelf. Not Tom. He pushes the boundaries. Tom's product is Cleveland whiskey. It's his hometown. Right on the label, radically different. So he's making it in week. He's making it in Cleveland. It's got to be the discount product. Not Tom. This product sells for a 30% premium to the national brand. And here's what's going on. Even in a week, Tom can't make this stuff fast enough to keep up with demand, running three shifts a day. It's the hottest whiskey product out there. It's won all these blind taste tests. Tom is back on his feet. He's killing it. And he did this because he had the guts, the fortitude, the grit, the determination, the passion to push the boundaries. He wasn't settling for making some teeny little incremental whiskey change. He said, damn it, I'm going to change the whole game. So as we kind of wind things down here, I want to give you a challenge. I want to end with a challenge, which is this. Over the next seven days, I want you to take a good look at your business. It doesn't just have to be the products and services that you, you do. It could be internal processes, or the way you hire, or which customers you pursue, or what your sales pitch looks like. But how can we find a single thing, one thing, to 10x? Is there a way that we can take something and really brainstorm and go all out on it? Can we 10x one aspect of our business in the next seven days? Here's what will happen. If you can find one thing, even if you don't implement it in seven days, just one big idea, it creates a snowball of momentum. And you'll, get, you'll gain progress, and you'll get excited, and you'll gain you know, morale. And then before you know it, that momentum drives the next 10x and the next 10x. And if you really want to think about sustainable growth, whether you're managed ser manage services or a software engineer or somehow tied into this beautiful ConnectWise universe, that 10x advantage is going to drive you ahead. We started here. We started with once great companies that were innovative in their day but failed to reinvent. They didn't embrace these principles, and today they show up on some guy's slide deck. That's not the fate for us. The opportunity for each of us here, my fellow IT leaders, our opportunity is to bust through that. It's to reinvent. And now is the time. Let's use today as a jumping off point. It's an opportunity to shed conventional wisdom to let our creativity soar, to bring our most imaginative ideas to the forefront, to drive innovation, to reinvent, and in turn, 
with partners like ConnectWise, ultimately to seize the enormous opportunity that's waiting for all of us just outside those doors. Thank you so much. There he is. All right. We're going to do some uh, Q&A. How about that? Perfect. A little questions and answers. I think you did a great job, you know, setting up the whole concept of reInvent. So hopefully you guys and girls got some great ideas here. But what we want to do now is open it up to questions that you might have. Hopefully we've got your, your, your mind kind of percolating about this concept of reinvention. So if we could... Um, just open it up. Anyone that wants to ask a question, there's mics at every one of these aisles. And please, someone who is bold and brave, get up and get the first question out. No, no, that, no I didn't say leave. <laughs> hi, Josh. Hi, Arnie. Steve Harper, Hutchinson, Kansas. What percentage of the people that have reinvented themselves that you know reinvented in a different industry or a different technology that the Toms of the world that went to make and why? You know, I don't know the exact percentage, uh, but, but there are different flavors of reinvention. So one flavor is you stay in the same industry or same general principle and reinvent within. So example there is Miles Davis, a jazz hero of mine. He was at the forefront of five different stylistic reinventions in the world of jazz. So he still was a trumpet player, still a jazz guy, but he reinvented within the industry. Then there's people like Wayne Huizinga. And Wayne had an idea. He started a waste management company, became very wealthy. Then he started Blockbuster Video, total divergence from his craft. Then he started AutoNation. So here's a guy who's done it three different times in three industries, created a billion dollar value in each of them. So I don't think we should feel restricted to only reinventing in our own wheelhouse. However, people sometimes feel like, oh, there's no room to reinvent in my wheelhouse. Yet we see that all the time. I mean, one fun example in our industry was Geek Squad. I mean, no one thought, oh, well, we're IT people and we can't create a different experience. And they went all out on this, this deeply experiential thing. And whether we like it or not, they ended up selling to Best Buy and had a huge outcome. So I do think that there's still plenty of room to reinvent within our industry, but of course there's opportunity to reinvent outside of it. Thank you. Hi, my name's Doug Renner. I'm with Peak IP Solutions out in California. Um, what do you do to get outside of your box, so to speak, to, incur to get yourself to do some of this free thinking and come up with these ideas? Well, there are so many fun things that you can do, uh, but I'll, show, I'll share with you briefly my favorite brainstorming technique of all, because it, it's very powerful and you can take it with you today. The technique is called role storming. Role storming. So basically you're brainstorming, but in character. So if you were in a normal, what's your name, first name again? Doug. Doug, okay. So Doug, if you were in a normal brainstorm session, you might hold back your best ideas. You don't want to look stupid. But in role storming, you are brainstorming, but in character. So Doug, let's say you were playing the role of Steve Jobs. No one's going to laugh at Steve for coming up with a big idea. They might laugh at you for coming up with a small idea. So now Doug, AKA Steve, is totally liberated. You can say anything you want, no fear at all. So the technique is very simple. You choose a character. It could be Barack Obama. It could be Kim Kardashian. Please don't. No. <laughs> it could be a literary figure, or a sports hero, or anyone you want. And it sounds goofy, but if you brainstorm a real business problem as if you're someone else, You'll be blown away. I did this once with a, a group of executives at Sony Japan. I met this guy who's the stiffest human being I've ever met. Suit, tied, real tight, you know, stiff as a board. Anyway, we got him role storming as Yoda. <laughs> I have never seen personal transformation like this. This guy's ties undone, his jacket's off, he's like leaping around the room, and the ideas were just flowing out of him. And the point is, I didn't teach him to be creative. He had that inside him all along. We all have that inside us right now. The thing is that sometimes our role prevents it from coming out. So this role storming technique is actually very powerful to get our best ideas to the surface. Thank you. Sure. Uh, let's go over here. Uh, Rick Van Cleve, uh, Bozeman, Montana. And my question is, how do you get to done as you're going through the reinvention, we start getting splintered, we're doing this, we're doing that, we get about 80% done and then we jump over to this and, and you know, what techniques do you use to, to get to done 
and not let it consume your regular business as you move forward? Rick, such a great question. One of the traps that we can fall into is we think about reinvention as a giant, overwhelming project, which either we don't start at all or it's difficult to get done. The best of the best do it a little differently. I, and this is a very different framework, but, but one I would encourage, which is that you look at reinvention as an ongoing process, not a once a decade type effort. But you break it down into smaller, more manageable aspects. So in other words, I wouldn't recommend necessarily that you reinvent everything about your business and life all at once. But instead, you, I might recommend is you might take one aspect. So let's say your product is the same, your service is the same, your team is the same, your culture is the same, but you just focus on customer experience. Just reinvent one thing at a time, get the benefits from that, get it over the goal line, and then move on to the next thing, which could be internal, uh, internal innovation in terms of your operations, or it could be your culture. So in, instead of trying to do everything at once, take one little thing, get it over the goal line, enjoy the results of it, and then move on to the next thing in more of a systematic, ongoing way, rather than a big, overwhelming one. Thank I you. like that. Uh, let's take this gentleman here. Hey guys, um, Bjorn's Real Off Decatur. Georgia. Um, we're trying to find good people. You know, that's a big challenge in this industry and the right people for your organization, culture fit. Um, you have a musical background. Uh, creativity <laughs> comes from that potentially. How, do you actually interview, or have, in the past, do you see people interviewing and asking creativity questions or trying to assess their creativity? And, and do you measure musical ability, or have you seen that? Um, I do interview for, for uh, cultural attributes, for sure. And creativity, I think, is a big one because that's going to drive people's progress. The problem is if you interview just for skills, let's say software coding, for example, those skills are going to change. So I'd rather see how do people solve problems? How do they make decisions in the face of ambiguity? How do they play the notes without all the sheet music in front of them? And to me, creativity is very much about that. I will say that musicians tend to make very good entrepreneurs. There have been all kinds of correlation. But to be clear, you don't have to be a musician. In fact, jazz musicians, I'll argue, are not any more creative than anyone else. So I've been a jazz guy, and I love it. 99% of the notes that you play are made up as you go. Spontaneous innovation. But the reason we're creative is not because some gift. It's because the culture supports it. So if, if you and I were playing a jazz gig together, and I played it safe, and I just did what I felt would work, you'd laugh me off the stage. On the other hand, you would encourage me to take risks, go out on a limb. And in jazz, by the way, a little secret, if you play the wrong note once, just play it twice more and call it art. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> but so the combo, that, that culture drives creative thinking. So if you can find someone with you, who you think has the right raw materials and your company itself fosters creativity, you'll be in good shape. Too often the opposite happens, where people hire folks who have great judgment, great creativity, but then never let them use it because they're so busy telling them about compliance and alignment and rule following. So I think that the more rope we can give our people to allow them to express the creativity, once we get the right people in the door, the more progress we'll enjoy. Thank you. Great sure. answer, great answer. Who is next here? How about you, sir, right there? Good morning, my question is actually for both of you. What do you think are some opportunities that are ripe for reinvention? I'll go first. You know, the sky's the limit right now. Uh, you know, my, my theory is because all information, people, and devices are connectable, I, I think you can just combine anything that you want together to create something new and different. You know, I mean, I, how many chat programs are, I'll give you an example, how many chat programs are out there? There's, there's millions of chat programs out there, but when ConnectWise looked at it, we saw it from a very different standpoint, and we thought it needed to be completely integrated to a ticketing system with presence so that you would have a Mayday button down on everybody's, uh, every one of your end user's desktop. You know, we thought, well, is that a unique idea? We actually filed for a patent on it, and in 90 days we got a patent on that. So it's sometimes these things sit right in front of your very face. You just have to zoom out a little bit and look at things a little bit differently. And I think that we really should be looking inside of our own industry, inside of the technology industry, because this is the catalyst for change. Technology is the catalyst that's changing every industry, it's changing every aspect of life today, and we're sitting here as the people who are ushering that into the world. So I think that we stay focused in the technology space and just zoom out and look and just think a little bit more creatively. Stop putting so many restrictions on yourself and the way that you think about things. You know, we come to these conferences and the, and the number one thing that we hear at ConnectWise all the time is, as we're implementing ConnectWise for all of you and partners, is they say, well, how would you do it? 
And, and I think that's not necessarily the right approach. We'll do that for you. We'll implement it however you want, but we can make it match your business however your business runs. Too many of us are asking each other, how do I do this? How do I do that? Uh, in our industry, the sky is the limit. So I would say absolutely just zoom out, look at it, connect a few dots a little bit differently, just, what we, just like we did uh, with Chat Assist. And, and let me say, this was exciting because as soon as I got off a of main stage yesterday, uh, I got an email saying that the US Patent Office actually awarded that patent, and that's our first patent. So cool. we're real excited about that. follow-up, I would say that nearly every industry is in the midst of massive upheaval. And because there's so much change happening in the world right now, the opportunities are, are literally infinite. Uh, I wrote a blog this week about the thing that you could think, well, there's no way you could reinvent a donut shop. I mean, a donut is a donut. There's something in New York City right now called a cronut, which is a mashup between a croissant and a donut. These things sell for five bucks a piece. So that's 10x more than a typical donut. There's a line out the door. They sell out thousands of them a day the minute they're, they're baked. And, and they reinvented the donut. So if they can reinvent the donut, I mean, think about what we can do with technology. And just pick the most mundane thing. What about an alarm clock? Well, with big data, with the semantic web, all these technologies, maybe your alarm clock sets itself. Instead of you saying 6.30 a.m., maybe it knows what time your first meeting is, it knows what the weather, weather patterns are, it knows if you or your wife are dropping off your kid at school, and based on all these factors, it sets the appropriate time for you automatically. So I think that the, the opportunities are limitless if we're willing to explore them. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, guys. Uh, Reese Horman, uh, Geek on Wheels, Denton, Texas. Uh, I've got a 20-man brake fix operation, and we are transitioning into MSP. And, uh, I wanted to get your advice on techniques to increase buy-in and get my team as motivated about this transition as I am, because there's some nervousness associated with it. I'm letting you do that one. <laughs> so you, there are two questions in there. First, let's start with the team. I think the team, you've got to make the case for change, because change is scary for all of us as human beings. So if I opened up today and said, hey, dude, let's go roll storm, you'd probably laugh me off of the stage. But when we talked about those companies that didn't reinvent and, and the ultimate fate that they endured, you got to make the case for it, why the status quo is really can be very dangerous and why we have to move in this new direction in order for sustainable success. So I think you got to get buy-in by sharing with them why. In terms of your customers, similarly, I think you want to focus on how you can serve them better, not sort of like we're making a change for us. So the more you-centric, the more customer-centric you can make that change, the better that they're going to embrace it. And you may also layer on a tad of, of um, the pain that you're solving. People always are willing to commit more dollars if you're solving a pain. So if you're selling a feature or a benefit, that's one thing. But if you're solving a pain, that's another way to 10x the approach. So if the pain that you're solving is, listen, you're experiencing all these negative, horrible things right now, and here's how we're going to solve it be by becoming this new business model, that may be a, an approach that customers would enjoy. Thank you. Uh, I want to add one thing to that. And, you know, a lot of times when you're trying to reinvent yourself, the best way to do it is to actually start a new practice area inside of your company. Instead of saying, gee, I want to switch my company over from, from break fix to managed services, the better way of thinking of it is we're still going to do break fix because a lot of our legacy customers are not going to move over. We need to start a new practice area, and maybe that's where you bring in your new thinking or maybe a new colleague into the company, or maybe you take one of your existing ones and say, you are the, you are the uh, czar of managed services here, and you own that, and you need to drive that into our company. But I think there's a lot of ways to do it, but I think you've got to think about starting something new instead of changing something that is. It's, it's easier to add something to your company and let that be that, that uh, sort of sell, that energy, that catalyst for change inside of your company. That's what we do. Thank you. Great point. Peter, clever ducks. Hey, thank you. I love this stuff. Thaler and Sunstein and Nudge said that if you could wish for one trait for your kids, it would be a positive disposition. And so much about this resilience that you're talking about just comes, flows out of that disposition. But we're not all tiggers, you know? Some of us are Eeyores or turtles. How can we unlock the tremendous ideas that are in the turtles and, and the Eeyores in our company? because the tickers won't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so true. And, and really, creativity is dr driven not by singularity of thought. It's by diversity. 
It's like you don't want to have a band and there's five guitarists. You want people who are playing different instruments. And I think the best thing you can do is create a, a cultural environment that allows the Tiggers and Eeyores to bring their ideas to the surface and, and have their ideas feel valued. And there are many techniques. The problem too often is that the person with the loudest voice or the fanciest title wins the argument. Mm. And I think what we need to do is say that the best idea wins, not the, not the most charismatic person. And there's all kinds of techniques that we can do to, to make this happen. Um, one of them is, is doing improv. So for example, I might start an idea, but I'm not allowed to keep rolling with it. Then Arnie has to take it from there, and then it has to go to you. And as it bounces around the room, various things come to life. Another thing is, if there are a bunch of ideas and you're deciding which idea should win, you put them all up on the board and give everybody 10 chips, poker chips, let's say. And each person can put as many poker chips on one idea, or they can spread them out however they want. So sometimes the boss. Instead of everyone saluting the flag, oh, your idea is the best, you're the boss, they put their poker chips wherever they want anonymously. And then it looks like a heat map. So if all these brains are gravitating to one idea that wasn't the boss's, now the boss has to let go a little bit and support the best idea. Very good, thank you. The only thing I would want to add to that is that you know, what we do at ConnectWise is we make everybody voice their opinion. Yes, we, everybody's got tiggers, right? And they dominate the conversation. But if you make it a completely democratic process where you say, look, everyone, everyone has to participate. And you know, the Eeyores and the Turtles, if you will, don't want to participate. You make them go, you go around the room and everybody gets an equal opportunity to speak their piece. And so what, what I find is that a lot of really creative people are very silent. You've got to pull it out of them. You've got to be the leader that pulls that creativity out of them. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is most, most people that will not share their ideas are exactly what Josh said. They're afraid. It's fear. They don't want to fail. And we've all been programmed through school and college that the way that we're going to succeed is to have the right answer, to get the A, to study, to know the material so well that when we have an answer, we're going to get a good grade. That's not how business works. Business is about failing fast. Business is about new ideas. There is no textbook for business necessarily. And so instead of letting people think the way that they've been programmed through our educational systems of here's your class, here's your syllabus, here's when you're going to take your test, here's the day you're going to take your test, and by the way, study your butt off because you get one shot at this, that's not how business is. Business iterates. And so let people be okay with failure. Let people understand that we want you to fall flat on your face. It's totally okay in our business at ConnectWise. We're very creative because we say, you're allowed to fall flat on your face. And you can fall on your face as many times as you want. And we encourage that. The only thing you're required to do is pick yourself right back up and keep moving forward. And that's the attitude that I like to foster and the culture that I like to foster in any business that I'm involved in. One super quick Eeyore strategy, that, that, is, that was really good. I just say one, one super quick Eeyore strategy is make someone the head of the committee. So if someone's like especially grumpy and they're poisoning your culture, you might say to them, hey Jim, um, I know you're not like this, but uh, there's this problem that we're having, would you mind leading a task force on it? It's amazing what happens is when you take an Eeyore and make them the head of the committee and make it their problem to solve it and give them some trust, how they rise to the challenge. I've seen it happen a bunch of times. It is a great way to do it. Who's next here? I guess you guys queuing it with the spotlight? Is that this gentleman here, I guess? Good morning, Scott Oster out of the DC area. So you have a 10X idea, you're a small IT company, you don't have the capital to really invest in it and get it moving. How do we go find venture capitalists who can help fund the ideas? He's right here. <laughs> <laughs> Brought my checkbook. <laughs> and I'll meet you in 10 minutes on stage. Arnie's announcing the new uh, ConnectWise fund and... <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the thing is this, venture capital is, is hard to, to, to secure. Only one out of 300 pitches gets funded. However, and this is the big however, if you really have a 10x idea, there's ample capital out there, whether you're in DC or Detroit or Silicon Valley or, or Bozeman, Montana, anywhere else. So I think if the idea is truly compelling, if you can show real value, how you're solving a real problem in the world, how you are truly differentiated, how you have sustainable competitive advantage, how you're going after a big market opportunity, if you have the right stuff, it's just like there's never enough room for a new Hollywood superstar, but if someone breaks on the scene, everyone wants them. Same type of thing with great thinking and great entrepreneurs. So I would say don't let the the overwhelming nature of it holds you back. If the idea is that good, people are going to want to fund it. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry. I think we have time for about two more questions. This gentleman's been very patient over here. Josh, thanks for speaking to us today. And uh, Arnie, thanks for being our Tigger. 
I am wondering how you know when the reinvention needs to be reinvented. Uh, a lot of us in here are running successful businesses. We're flying in the air. We're willing to go make some adjustments, change our beverage service, but we don't want to saw an engine off the plane. So if we start to make these incremental changes, how do we get the momentum to keep making changes if one change fails, move on to the next one, and stay positive about it? How do we inculcate that culture? So it's, you know, there's not a silver bullet answer to that, but one thing is that one trap that people fall into is the overcorrect. So if you try something and it doesn't work, and by the way, not everything is going to work, your instinct might be to say, oh, we tried that a long time ago, or that's the last time I'm going to do something big. And that's a much scarier thing than failing at one thing at all. So the dust yourself off comment is spot on. I think it's, it's so important. Uh, and, and it's, like I said, you know, you're, you're, you're flying the plane. You've got to keep the engines on. But on the other hand, what's the risk of not? You know, I, I think it's so incumbent on all of us as leaders to think of ourselves in an ongoing state of reinvention. Software companies are great at that. You know, Apple just launched the iPhone 8. It's, you know, or iPhone 6, I'm sorry. 8's next iPhone 6, wonderful success. And basically, the, the point is it puts the iPhone 5 out of business. It makes it irrelevant. And there's no way I, Apple is going to someday say, well, we're kind of done. iPhone 6 is it for the rest of eternity. They're in the groove of always reinventing. And just like software companies or tech companies, I think in the managed services space, the exact same thing. What, what does your version 3.2 look like? What does your version 5.0 look like? And the thought of standing still is so crazy for a software company. should be crazy even if you run an insurance agency. And let me add this, as a CPA, as a CPA, think about it. When you've got your accounting statements and your balance sheet, you always have an allowance for debt, right? You always have allowance for bad debt, right? There's a budget for that, right? You have an allowance for bad debt. You should have an allowance for bad ideas, okay? And then just make that part of the way that you think about your business. I mean, we fund all kinds of crazy ideas at ConnectWise, but if we don't do that, then we're never going to innovate. So we encourage it. We have a budget for it, and we accept it. And I think accepting failure is how you break the fear of your people, and you, you unleash creativity like nothing else in, that you've ever seen. And, and I just encourage you to make that a big part of your culture. If you make that part of your culture, you're going to see amazing results, and your people are going to love working there. So true. I think you were the last gentleman that was up there. Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe we can get one more, but go ahead. I was going to say, how would you motivate someone that is kind of content with the status quo to reinvent themselves if they're just content doing the same thing every day? And you want to promote, promote that within your technicians, you know, uh, I, you know, accounting, anything. I think you've got to fast forward. What does the world look like 10 years from now if you don't reinvent? Ask them, say, let's just, let's just play a, a, a game. What, what do we think um, this particular actress is going to look like 10 years from now? Oh, they're going to age, they're going to change the roles, whatever. So what will you look like assuming you do nothing? Vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the industry, the rest of the company. And so I think sometimes people cling so close to the status quo because it feels safe and because they don't feel the need to change. So as a leader, I think your job is to help them see a future that involves letting go of the reins a little bit and taking those responsible risks because the risk of standing still is far riskier. And people don't intuitively feel that way, so perhaps as a leader, you, know, you can help, help nurture that along. By the way, as a leader, I would say our job, you know, many of us are leaders here. Leaders are, in my opinion, leaders should be servants, not kings. So too often when someone reaches the corner office, when they, they reach the corner office, they feel, well, it's my turn in the sunlight, and everyone works for me, and I'm going to boss people around. And, <laughs> it's the opposite. I think I had 500 team members, and my job every day was to serve them. How can I make them successful? How can I help them reach their dreams? How can I push and prod so they become the embodiment of their full potential? And so if we look at our role as leaders that way, and someone is a little stuck, just like you would push your kid along if you, if you were a parent, same thing with people. You don't want to be paternalistic, but you do want to help them move ahead in their career. That's sort of our job and our responsibility as leaders. And you're asking that question, I think, because you're trying to invoke change, and you've got someone who's got you stuck. And that person is the person in charge of trying to drive that change forward. So the bottom line is that person that you're talking to is way too afraid to take chances. So, and that's because of you. Okay? So I'm going to put it on you. And then I'm going to tell you there are some people that are, I think everyone is capable of being creative. But you have to find a way to pull that creativity out of that person and make them feel safe being creative and failing. And if you can do that, you'll do that with that person, it'll infect the rest of your company.
All right, one last one, you sir. Awesome, thank you. Um, you say that uh, reinventing yourself and, and uh, progress should be an ongoing thing. What kind of habits or daily rituals do you have to keep that going forward? Hmm. One thing that I love to do, and, and I can leave you with this challenge, uh, is schedule time. You know, we're so busy most of our days being heads down. You know, we're doing transactional, get our to-do list done. The problem is when you're heads down, you don't notice the world around you. So I, I do this, and I would encourage you to do the same. Schedule a couple hours a week, even 5% of your time. 40-hour week, 5% of the time is only two hours a week. Schedule it as important time to be heads up, to ask why, what if, and why not, to explore, to, to, to brainstorm on 10xing your business. Uh, and you, use that time seriously. Go to an art museum instead of sitting at your desk. Uh, go on a walk, blast loud music, whatever it is that you connect with creatively. When I've seen people do this, Here's what I hear back. First thing I hear back is a 0% drop in productivity. Zero. Magically, 40 hours a week gets smushed into 38 hours. No one misses a beat. But then you have this leftover gift, which is really a gift to your company if, if you have an idea that could be transformative. But even more than that, it's a gift to you as a person. Because there are very few things in life that are as satisfying as, as the creative expression we, we, we have as human beings. So I would do that. I would just get into a rhythm and a habit of making it priority time, just like you'd schedule time in the gym or schedule time to, to, to do an important meeting. Make it important and make it a priority. Thank you. And most of the great ideas that have come out of great companies like Google have come from just that. They actually budget a certain amount of time for their people to just do something different, to think differently. You know, for instance, if you're a software development company like ConnectWise, and I know a lot of you are out here, you know, we actually sponsor hackathons. So once a month, we let our developers do whatever they want, come up with creative ideas. And we've had a lot of really cool new concepts come up as a result of that. So it's all about encouraging creativity. You know, school systems, at least here in the United States, absolutely do not really foster or develop creativity. And so once these folks are coming out of college, and I know a lot of us are hiring people straight out of college, you've got to actually take them and, and get them creative right away and sort of flip them into your model of creative thinking. It's very important to do that. If you can do that, again, you're, you're going to have amazing results. So a, a culture of creativity, a culture of reinvention has to be, exist in every one of our technology companies because if we're not staying up with everything that's changing, we're going to cease to exist. It's just that simple. All right. Well, thank you all very much. This was a great session.